The oolons of Marajara to six strike two large stones continuously during a meal. Humans no longer own each other in that way. Madeline seems to have a very nice relationship with dicks. Hello, everybody, and welcome to <laughs> The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2, Episode 19, Manhunt, written by Tracy Torme as Terry Devereaux, directed oh, okay. by Rob Bowman. And this was June 17th, 1989, after a uh, looks like three week hiatus. Where were you? And uh, what's up, Sirach? How are you today? What's up? Um, so, yeah, we I was wondering this Terry Devereaux name. It did sound like kind of like out of nowhere but so it's tracy torme who we've seen before right and they just tracy decided to have this um this other pseudonym as a writing name is that what it is i guess so so i don't know why he chose that he was definitely um you know on on the, the writing team quite a bit uh maybe they just sometimes they'll do it if they're not proud of a script. Sometimes they'll do it if they don't want to seem like there was favoritism because he has the the Mel Torme last name. But I don't know what the reason for that is. Maybe someone will know in the free for all. However, we have a very special thanks to give today to Dr. Brenda Custodio for sponsoring hey. this episode. Our good friend, Brenda. Dr. Brenda. Thank you so much for that. And now, on with the episode. So, Ciroc. Yeah. Favorite episode of the year so far? <laughs> no, not favorite episode. One of. Um, no, not even in the one of category. But it is interesting. Um, there are elements of it that are interesting, particularly these alien characters that i felt like were original in their design and costume extra long arms the silvery shimmery um wardrobe that was designed for them really kind of unusual uh, like a fish like alien i thought mm -hmm. they were like you know it's just really cool alien design the costume um they really showed uh, showed off their skills in this episode when it comes to the originality of uh this particular alien design what about if i told you that a very successful rock musician played one of the antedians that's something um that would be something <laughs> that means they'd have to sit there in that makeup for the whole day <laughs> Well, uh, it was Mick Fleetwood of Fleetwood Mac, a very successful band out of the 70s and 80s. Lots of great songs. Um, yeah. You know, every once in a while, there's somebody that's like a really big Star Trek fan that's just like, I want to be on the show, whatever it is. And they go, all right, put a fish head on you. And it's probably like, cool, deal. And then he does it and he's like, man, I wish I was just an ensign. <laughs> Could they just have me an ensign <laughs> yeah. walking through the hall? <laughs> Yeah, I could have been a red shirt easy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's to discourage other people. They don't want a long line of people just saying, hey, we want to be in this. They, they're like, oh, you want to be in this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Spread the word. Wasn't James Worthy in a Klingon at one point? Um, that's what yes. I, I heard about. Yeah, good so, knowledge. So another celebrity guest. And, and, um, Ira was obsessed with that singer I Iggy Pop, right? Yep, he was a Vorta. We also had Dr. May Jemison, uh, who was a, a, an astronaut, astronaut, NASA astronaut. And who's the yeah. other one I'm thinking? Oh, Seth MacFarlane, too. He was in uh, two episodes of Enterprise, if I remember correctly. I believe it's two episodes, but it, there are times. Under, under heavy makeup, though? No. Mm -mm. No, Seth was regular. Yeah, he got to be and, just... and, and Mae Jameson was she regular as well or just herself yes. or okay. Mm -hmm. So but yeah, yeah, but under the heavy the heavy makeup people, I think uh Iggy Pop with as a Vorda 
Um, you've got this uh, Fleetwood Mac, Mr. Uh, Mike Mick Fleetwood himself. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> As so, a giant pretty, Antedian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's cool. That's you know, cool. that's that's like one of those little pieces of trivia. I'm sure there are tons of others. Um, there are also a lot of actors and actresses that we'll see throughout this series that will be like, whoa, that's so and so before they made it, you know. Uh right. like uh I believe Terry Hatcher. We saw Terry Hatcher already, right? That was yeah. interesting. And there's Kirsten Dunst, uh, there's Ashley Judd, a lot of people that we'll yeah. see later. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. So that's them. Well, that's, that's a, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, the, the aliens were interesting. Like I said, again, there were other elements that I, I also like. I thought the fact that they were in this uh, catatonic state with their eyes seemingly closed was another just cool um, touch. Um, so I did like their their entire situation, you know, as far as their character didn't say much and didn't really have much to do with the plot as a I guess this was the B storyline even though it came in as the A storyline which is mm -hmm. a little unusual for it to be the lead in and not be the A storyline um, structurally we normally see the lead in be the, the main thing so except they are tied into the a storyline of this uh conference that's happening on this planet so which luoxana is tied in with i thought luoxana was the main story of this episode if you know stealing the show if she wasn't but to me it seemed that she's the main story uh and this is the second time we've seen her character if i'm not mistaken yeah right? is this i believe so so we've already got experience with her. The captain already knows her personality. So there was a kind of a like, he already knows what he's in for, or, you know, type of thing already set up. Oh, did you notice, uh, obviously we had Chief O'Brien. We had another yeah. uh, Star Trek star appearing in this episode. It was this person's, I believe, very first uh, acting gig on Star Trek. If I, I, I think this was their first. It was. Who's that? Who is it? Who is it? Bob O'Reilly, Robert O'Reilly, Gowron himself. He was like the second yeah. gangster guy that went and visited Dixon Hill. Remember the first one pulls a gun on him. And then the second one, yeah. like grabs him and strangles him for a second, and then he's gone. And then the first one comes back with like a Gatling gun, yes, or machine gun, maybe it was. And so Bob O'Reilly, you know, he only had like one or two lines, and he looked yes. super young and skinny. But it was definitely that was definitely actually, I'm sure it's yeah. There he is, Robert O'Reilly playing Scarface was the character. <laughs> I didn't even pick up on that. It, it was um, it's very quick. Next time, next time, Bob, make sure your hat's not in the way of your face because you did block your face with the hat, mm -hmm. and it didn't give us enough. It didn't give me enough time to recognize that it was you. So, a little trick that I'm sure you've long since learned. But <laughs> open your face up a little bit more to the camera. Might have been direction too. They might have just said, you know, keep it yeah. down and low and mysterious, which is too bad because you want to have your face seen. You know, I'll be honest though the the Dixon Hill stuff is never was never my thing. It's just, you know, and and some people eat it up. Some people are like, awesome, this is a Dixon Hill episode. I can't wait. What a deal. Madeline's going to be like, how's it going, Dix? You know, get in there, Dix, with their, you know, whatever. And it, people love that kind of stuff. And then they have like their little gangster talk. But to me, it doesn't, you know, I don't usually like stuff from, you know, late 1800s or early half of the 1900s. That just doesn't really grab me. The one part I did like, though, was when Picard talks about World War II, that little tongue in cheek 
talk about like, you know, when they were saying Germany's about to invade England, he's like, oh, actually, and he goes on to this. At least mm -hmm. that was fun for me. So, you know, um, the period piece that is similar to that, that I did like when I was growing up was Dick Tracy. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that there's elements of what they're trying to pull off here that are Dick Tracy like. The problem with it and the reason why I don't think it resonates with me as well is that I don't see enough alter in his persona um, as far as I, I still see a stiffness. I think <laughs> she called him, Luaxana said he still has a stiffy side, you know, and she, she calls it like a stiffy side. <laughs> I don't know what she was looking at exactly, but. <laughs> I think that it's, that's the front. <laughs> okay, well, let's say, <laughs> let's just say that, you know, I feel like he has this kind of, oh, stuffy, sorry, stuffy side. Is oh, that's okay. Stuffy. <laughs> that makes a little more sense. I was like, wow, I'm surprised yeah. I missed that. <laughs> stuffy side. Yeah, he has a stuffy side. And there's a, there's a stuffy miss to him when he plays even the Dixon Hill characters like there's not a smoothness to him even for example the way he was holding the cigarette he got handed a cigarette so you know in that particular character the guy smokes a cigarette and you would and he would know that if this is a program that he goes into a lot because the guy's mm -hmm. handing him a cigarette like he knows that he wants one and the way he handled it was stuffy in a way like oh this thing this thing you know as opposed to playing the dix dixon hill character right. and smoking the cigarette lean back playing this more smoother kind of detective guy who got things figured out and that's where that's where i don't see enough change behaviorally in uh patrick stewart's performance from from picard to this character i would like to see a switch where he smooths into this character and becomes this alter ego of himself that's more um flirtatious and more um you know just just better at the things that he lacks in in his own personality do you know what i mean that's a really good point um it's not really escapism if you're acting like yourself uh because that's what he's doing yes. like when people do this it's like a fantasy it's like you know, if there's a guy that's super stiff all the time, he's going to go into like a pool party or a frat house or something and just like or a camping trip and just let loose. But if Picard is, you know, this stuffy, you know, whatever captain, and then he goes into a totally different situation and he's still acting like that and he's still being rigid. And he's still being very socially awkward, um, clearly an introvert, and he just stays like that, even in his fantasies. Then, yeah. then it seems more like it's cerebral than it is escaping. You know, it seems like it's more like he's reading a book more than he's going on a vacation. And I feel like the holodeck, I, I guess it could be used for both, but it does seem like he certainly is much more cerebral. It is an approach to the holodeck, whereas most other people use the holodeck to get away and to have fun and to do some kind of fantasy situation that they don't get to do in real life. But he can act yeah. like a regular Joe or, you know, anywhere. It doesn't. That's, well, that's it's true. like if I if I if I went into a old Wild West program, I would expect to alter my demeanor to be ready for a gunfight, to take 10 mm -hmm. space, you know, ten paces and turn, to be drinking whiskey, you know, to be at a saloon with the doors that flop back and forth and just be, there's a certain saunter I would change up just because totally. I expect it to be a badass in a situation where I know only the badasses survive, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I, I just don't see enough of the alteration to his character when he is in his own element supposedly he walked in that office for example and it was as if he didn't know where to stand and what to do in this office that 
is is his playground, right? It's like when a kid goes on a playground, they grab the ball, they play the tether ball, they they run, they do the hopscotch. They, they don't need to stand around and look around like, what do we do here on the playground? You know, it's like <laughs> they they just get into the playground. You play handball, you do something, right? You race somebody, play tag. You get in the, the spirit of the of the the place that you're in. And when he was walking into that office, if that is his office that he often goes to, he would open a drawer and know that there's a box of cigars there waiting for him. He would know certain elements of that space because he's been in there a lot. And it's something that he feels super comfortable with. He had, he cranked, you know, he had the music on, which was an element I wanted to talk about a little bit. Yeah, it was a cute song, whatever it was. I didn't recognize it, but I was like, oh, that's not, I actually listened to the lyrics. You know, I actually enjoyed the little lyrics for that moment. That was pretty good. But I do see what you mean. It's kind of like, why would you go to, you know, a Rise of Beach program on the holodeck, but then show up in like a suit and then walk <laughs> around on the, no, you're going to get in. You're gonna, if you're going to do that, you're going to go play volleyball or go play in the water or whatever. Um, and yeah, he doesn't. And, and to your point about the Western, I can totally picture that. I feel like Within 10 seconds of walking around, you kind of look, you see the the barns and the saloons and the people walking around, the horses, and you just kind of would get into a groove. You would just kind of be like, all right, this is nice. You know, you kind of get in a nice little swagger or saunter and you get you get into the you get into the vibe of it. You know, you feel you start feeling it, but he doesn't. And so it's tougher for us to. But that's it just seems like these first couple seasons, they're really showing how introverted and antisocial Captain Picard is. It's almost crippling in a lot of ways. You know, like he can't handle kids. He's not good with uh, Luoxana Troy making passes at him. I mean, obviously it's because he's not interested, but at the same time, he doesn't handle it well. You know, although it was very funny when he brought Data in. But, you know, there are a lot of things that are that are crippling to him. And it's all social things. And he says the wrong, you know, sometimes he's too curt with people or too rigid, but I, I mean, will... even his own secretary in the program was surprised that he asked her out for the drink, right? She's like, you want to hang out with me? You're like, you're a loner. You're awkward. You're the guy who's socially awkward. You, you don't want, you don't want me to talk to you. You want me to leave your messages on the desk and not even verbally tell you what it is going on. Cause you, you have this system that is in play where I have to, you know, write things down, not talk to you, leave it on the desk and, and be very short with you in our brief, in my little brief interaction that I have with you be on your way to your office. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't show, it doesn't show a good social side of him, which is in interesting because once again, the theme of the show is to explore, uh, <laughs> cultures and new, new civilization in life. So you, the guy you would send to go introduce everybody is not the guy who doesn't have the social skills to even get along with his own teammates, you know? And you would have a person more interested and curious about, you know, people and their behavior and studying them and, 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 and you know, maybe playing into some of their things and not being so rigid sometimes. But um, that's how he plays it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just a choice. It's part of his choice. I wonder if it helps and... him. I wonder if it, you know, like if I wonder if the character of Captain Picard is like he, he knows he's an introvert. He knows he's rigid. And he goes to this thing that's like still kind of rigid and still kind of structured but a little cooler, a little looser. It's like it's like his therapy you know I mean? or something where it's like it's like just dipping his toes in in something a little different. Maybe he's just doesn't work well with. Well, he does go to Riza. We will see one or two episodes of him on Riza. That'll be coming up. Well, to his credit, he also may be uh, facing some of his fears by accepting this position to explore and he may be challenging himself to try to overcome those uh, deficiencies that he knows he has so this may be a show that is an attempt to try to work out that 
therapy of him, you know, self healing and this particular aspect of his personality. So maybe that's what the show in general is trying to seek to do. And over time, we will see him loosen and soften and grow bonds and become more compassionate in certain areas. You know, I, I, I don't want to uh, limit the possibilities before I see what's where it goes, you know. But um, from th- from my from this perspective, at least in this alter ego persona of Dixon Hill, I don't see enough to distinguish him from this alter ego or this fantasy that he likes to play out. There's not enough switch and change in his behavior that lets me, that lets me get involved into the episode where I'm happy to see, Oh, let me go see this side of Picard. Cause this is going to be the, the cool Picard guy, you know? Yeah. The fun one, uh, like data playing one. Carlos. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> this is nails from Chicago. And this is Carlos. From South America somewhere. <laughs> yes, <laughs> That's pretty good. Good yes. old Data. He knows how to get into character. Yeah. I, and Data has fun. He has so much fun. Uh, and within the parameters of certain about a rigidity that he has to his performance, right? So he actually uses rigidity as part of his comedy. And his, his stiffness is part of his, his shtick, you know? Um, like when he was invited to the dinner, uh, that was for me, I, that, that had yeah. to be the highlight of the episode for me was, yeah. you yeah. know, Picard's just thinking, how do I get out of this? What do I do? And he's just like, yeah. oh, oh boy, I'm really curious. Uh, commander data, what's the answer to whatever the thing was? He's like, this is fascinating. Come on over. And data is just like a pig in shit there. He's so happy. He's telling, he's like, oh, well, then there's also this. And he started bringing up like graphs and stuff. (laughs) That was great. That's the perfect use for data. That was a very memorable scene to me. In fact, I think that's the only scene I really remembered from this episode. I remember seeing the Antedians. I remember, you know, these fish people. And I remember it being Mick Fleetwood. But other than that, the only other thing I remember was data's role in that dinner party for two. Um, and yeah, we got I to see uh, was, Mr. Home or hum. Yes. That was the other moment that I thought was one of the better moments of this episode. When Picard comes in with that bottle in his hand and Mr. Home grabs the bottle and just kind of downs the whole thing. I thought that was a nice little fun, fun Nails moment. It. But you know, yeah. here's the problem with that guy. I never know whether to call him Mr. Hom or Mr. Home. And I think it's because uh, Major Roddenberry pronounces it both ways. She she called him Hom a couple times. And then in the, the last time she mentioned him, she said, come along home. She said, come along home, which made me think of move along home. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, mm-hmm. now I know why I never remembered how to pronounce his name is because it's been said both ways it's been said hom and home it's very confusing for me well um on the subtitles it's spelled h-o-m-n yeah. oh two it should be two m's h-o-m-m i don't know what it said on the okay. subtitles but that's what they i'm pretty sure that's the okay. name and i love that actor he's got some kind of uh how tall is he, he belgian be like looking name Belgian or Dutch. That's like, where is he? Carl Striken. So that's got to be for sure Dutch or maybe Belgian. Um, I don't know. Or Carol, Carol Striken. Let me see if it says how tall he is. He looks like he's seven <laughs> two yeah. or something like that, right? <laughs> he's, he's, yeah, he looks huge. Yeah, I don't see it. Oh, but let's, uh, I'm going to keep looking, but let's hop to our quick break. And then uh, on the other side, we may have an answer for you. Right back on The Seventh Rule. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Ciroc Lofton. You know what we're doing. We're having a blast. Here come the trivioids of the week. We only have three more episodes of the second season already, if I remember correctly nuts oh, all right okay. 
It's not 26 this season? No, only 22 because oh, okay. it was like strike shortened because they're already in June, you know? Okay. So okay. they go as follows. The enterprise is tasked with transporting Antedian dignitaries. We've got a bunch of them today. Luoxana Troy is the daughter of the fifth house, holder of the sacred chalice of Rix. Put a pin in Rix. Heir to the holy rings of Beta Zed. Humans no longer own each other in that way. Mr. Hom drinks all of Captain Picard's blue beverage. Captain Picard really wants to know how many other cultures give thanks for their food. The Ulans of the Ulans of Marajaratus six strike two large stones continuously during a meal. Data's anecdotes are the stuff of legend on the ship. Wesley thinks Worf is handsome for a Klingon. Germany's getting ready to invade England. Dix had a snootful already. Luoxana Troy takes the turbo tube or whatever you call it. Rex doesn't have a last name. Rex saved his best stool for Luoxana. And Madeline has a great relationship with Dix. Um, so what rhymes with Dix is Rix. And she says, holder of the sacred chalice of Rix. And the reason that caught my attention is because Rix, R-I-X-X, is also the name of Captain Rix, who is in one of the very first episodes in the first season. Uh, he was a bullion. He was like a pinkish purple bullion. Captain Rix. Let's see if I can pull him up. See if you remember this guy. It was uh, when they were first talking about... They were first talking about... Uh, it's played by Michael Berryman. Uh, TNG Conspiracy. Remember when they had they went on the planet and they had like the three or four you know captains and admirals and stuff. Check this guy out. I'll pull up a picture here. I, I don't remember to answer your question, Ryan. No, I I, I got lost with Ricks, Rex, Dix, Dex. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of things happening in this episode. Okay, I remember that guy though. Yes. Yeah, in the yeah. first season, uh, conspiracy that the, the three or four of them went down on a planet, and there was like an yes. admiral, there was a lady, there was this guy, and uh, so that's Captain Ricks. I don't think I, did he die? I don't think so. I think he's still around. But anyway, so his name is Captain Ricks R I X X, which is exactly the same as the Chalice of Ricks. So it's like, is there some kind of connection, or is this just a coincidence? I don't know. You get, I'm, I'm way thrown for a loop there at this point. I'm, Somebody's got to gotta know the, the answer to this. <laughs> this is about to make me catch the phase. Uh, uh, speaking of the phase, though, I wanted, did you see the look on uh, Riker's face? The, there was a few moments, but the look on his face when uh, Deanna tells him, yeah, you know, your sex drive quad, uh, quadruples. And then oh, she's yeah. like, Mo even more. And he's like, more? And he, <laughs> big old Riker smile he's like yeah we're staying together we're not going anywhere how old are you now how close are we uh That's the answer exactly. <laughs> the answer answer to Carol Striken uh it says Carol Striken is a vegetarian and likes gardening uh he is seven foot zero yeah seven feet yeah, and yeah. he is Dutch yeah definitely a Dutch name yeah. And he also played, um, was it Lurch or, yeah, I think it's Lurch, the Adams Family guy, I think, right? He looks familiar. I've seen him before at the conventions too, actually. Yes, he's definitely been to those. Um, yeah. yeah, the Adams Family. Anyway, so I like him, and I think it's really cool because he's a funny actor. For somebody that has no lines, they still give him funny moments and he acts them well. You know, he just, when he drank the blue drink and he goes, hmm, you know, makes little faces, you know, mm -hmm. pretty good. Uh, speaking of faces, the face that uh, Picard makes in the end of the teaser when Loaxana says, Sean Luke, what naughty thoughts? And he kind of does this look on his face like, you know, 
like he's just he, he gets embarrassed, you know. Um, love the the look on his face. Um, you think he was thinking? Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a setup. It's a setup. It it reminds me of uh, I was in the library as a kid one time, and we were taking some kind of you know standardized test in the library that day, and a friend of mine walks next to me. And he farts really. It's a quiet library. He farts real loud right next to me. And then he says, Ugh, it's a rock. And, and so everybody turns and looks at me. And there's no, there's no way to get out of that fast enough. Before, you just, just been set up, right? So, you just laugh. <laughs> you laugh. You, you're like, no, I didn't. But it's too late. Because the more you deny it, the more everybody else thinks it's you anyway. So it, it, it's a setup. And to me, that's the same feeling that he you know, got. It was like. I heard that story, Ciroc, and I heard it a little differently. Yeah, yeah, so right. that's all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's a setup, and there's no way to get out of it for Picard because she's claiming to read his mind. We mm-hmm. know she's a Betazoid, so she has the ability to do that. And uh, all he can say is, "That's not what I'm thinking." But everybody is going to make it look worse anyway. So to me, it's like it doesn't matter whether he's thinking that or not. It's a setup. That's what I mean. It kind of reminds me of that story. So, um, and speaking of Luaxana, there is an element to her that I, I, I can't help but feel the Lucille Ball vibes every time she pops around. The same way that Lucille Ball would like to make it all about her and her adventure. It didn't matter what was going on. She would find a way to just take over the whole situation. Uh, that's how the Waxana Troy is. Every time she shows up, it's, 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 she just takes over and it's like, oh, okay, we just got to deal with her and, you know, get, make it through, make it through. It's almost the same effect that Q has, you know, it's, but hers is more comical. So it, it reminds me of, um, you know, I love Lucy. Mm, um, yeah. yeah. It reminds me of I love Lucy. And, no. um, no, what Sorry. were you going to say? I was, just, I was kind of thinking, uh, just kind of veering from that a little bit, because she kind of had the moment of the episode where she says, oh, these guys are assassins, they're planning the whatever. And so it gave her, you know, a climax, you know, like a five second climax, which wasn't really... I, I I was as we were, I was watching the episode. I kept thinking, like, when is this going to build up? Where where's the conflict? Where's the? I mean, there was conflict, but I guess I mean, where's the climax? Where's the the tension? Where's the you know the build up? And it wasn't coming. And then all it was was her just saying, "Oh, these guys are assassins." They didn't even like pull out guns. They didn't like transport. And then there's like a few minute struggle or stress. They walked away just peacefully. They're like, she's like, "Oh, they're assassins," and they're like. Oops, you got me here. Let's just go walk to holding. Like that was so that felt yeah. like a kind of a letdown. And I was just thinking it definitely had this episode, the bones of something that could have been very good. And I think it's that they should have given us more higher stakes, right? Throughout the episode. What if before we even see Locks on a Troy, they're saying, we're transporting these two dignitaries to this conference that is said to be very dangerous. It has a high terrorism rate or there's a high threat or there's a high something, right? And so it's a stressful thing. And then Loxana Troy shows up and Deanna Troy is even more stressed. She's like, mother, you can't go to this. It's a dangerous, this is a dangerous conference. It's a dangerous peace conference or something like that. So then the tension's building because she's getting closer and closer to going to this thing that's unsafe. And then at the end, if she finds a people and she says, oh, actually, here are the assassins right here. They're blah, 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 blah. Then it kind of, it, you know, it, it gives us just a little bit more. It, it you know, gives us the, a little bit more of the, the satisfaction of something being solved or a solution to some kind of tense problem. I don't know. It's just a thought. No, I get it. I didn't feel like the stakes were high enough. I didn't feel like there was any one in danger or anything serious were, was ever going to come out of anything. There was nothing on the line. 
the only thing that was seemed serious to me in this episode was uh, Deanna Troy's feelings being hurt when Luaxana asked her about Riker and the the face that she gave, like the she literally felt like you know, <laughs> damn mom, <laughs> you know, really. Um, Did you notice so, Deanna Troy tripping when she came out of the turbo lift towards the end there? No, she fully no, tripped. Did. I watched it like five times, like right at the end. When she and Mr. Home and uh, Loxana Troy are walking out of the turbo lift together, Troy kind of stumbles and she looks at Mr. Home and then she stumbles more and she and she almost does this thing where it's like she assumes they're not going to keep the take because she fully stumbled. But, you know, she just did what any professional actor would do, which is nobody yelled cut. So I guess. I guess we're going with this. You know, I guess we're still going to keep going. She did a good job of just kind of like rolling with it, but she stumbled pretty significantly there. Uh, if anybody hasn't seen it, uh, go back and check it out. It's like the last minute, maybe the last two minutes. Yeah, I, I didn't see that. But what I did see was when Worf kind of had his hands, his sleeves rolled up and he was digging into the, and then, into Dean's food. Oh, yeah. And I was and I was thinking to myself, what is he gonna fucking hand feed them? Like they're like are they seals? I, I didn't know what he was <laughs> planning on doing. <laughs> like was, is that the culture? Like to hand feed them the way he was doing? Because he just had his sleeves rolled up like I got this. <laughs> and he, like I'll just He's I'll like, just I've been preparing everything. for this my whole life. I I'm I'm on it. <laughs> Did you get yeah. uh, did you get a little grossed out when the Antedians were eating their what vermicula? Yeah, 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 yeah. slurping. Yeah, me too. I, I was, was like, surprised. Seriously, cut cut away, guys. We don't need to see this <laughs> for a while. I was actually surprised because usually I don't get grossed out too easily, but like yeah. that actually worked on me. All the sounds and the stuff swirling around, and the the fact that they stayed on there for a while. You know, that's what it yeah. was. Where they just they just kind of stayed on there yeah. uncomfortably long. I think that's what got me. And I'm like, these are the people you want joining the Federation? <laughs> <laughs> what are they bringing to the table? They Vermicula. You know, <laughs> you know their, chair, their, their chair, right? They've got bombs in their lining and their coat. I don't understand why... The, the Federation didn't do a better job kind of, uh, um, I don't know, going through their, uh, the people's, what are, what are the qualifications to enter into the Federation and what kind of um, processes there that you kind of, you know, siphon out people. I don't understand how that works but uh this one definitely fell under the radar for federation intelligence because uh they missed the boat on this and like you said it was very anticlimactic at the end like oh they're assassins see you later i i, I thought that was terrible um okay here's something for you Sirac. here's something yeah. for you there was one what? other scene that i do remember uh from way back in the day and I didn't remember what episode this scene was in. I just remember this moment. And the moment was that Data fully laughs. Riker is talking about Loxana Troy to Wes and Data, you know, on the bridge. And he's kind of making fun of her. They're having a, you know, a laugh at their at her expense. And he's like, oh, and then she does this and that, whatever. And then Wes and Data share a laugh, and Data goes like, ha, 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 ha. Now, he's got kind of his back turned to us, but you can definitely see he laughs, and then Picard comes in, he's like, oh, that's enough, or whatever. And he turns back to the front where the camera can see him still kind of smiling and grinning. And so, of course, that's, true, yeah. that's one of those things where there's a big difference between the production reason and the in-universe reason. The production reason is a director or a writer, producer, or the actor made a choice that Data laughed, and now 
35 years later in hindsight, we go, data shouldn't be laughing. That's a mistake, right? In universe, mm -hmm. very easily explained. They just say, oh, well, he's just trying to be more human. He just has a subroutine or an algorithm that lets him know, hey, now's the time to laugh. If I want to act more like a human, I'm going to laugh when they laugh, you know? So it was just one of those yeah. interesting things where you could say like, I can see the in-universe ex explanation and I could guess what the production explanation might be. But it was just weird when I was a kid first seeing that. I was like, what? That's, the heck? Data's not supposed to laugh. That's so you caught that as a kid. You thought that was strange that he was laughing. I was livid. Yeah. So you were upset about it. <laughs> I, mean, I was just kind of like, what the heck? Why? And so I remembered that moment you know, whatever it's been for 20 years or whatever, but I didn't remember what episode that was in. I just remember it was kind of earlier on because they didn't have a full grasp of the character quite yet. And so when I saw it, I was like, ah, there it is. I'm not crazy. I, I knew I remembered him laughing because <laughs> it stuck out. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that stuck out for me was that um, Luaxana is also the computer. Yeah. And there was a moment there where she was talking to the computer. So she's talking to herself. And I was trying to notice the way in which she alters her voice for her character as opposed to for the computer. Totally. And I thought that she does a very good job of the computer voice, taking all her emotion out of it and being very, you know, monotone and futuristic and sounding as mm -hmm. the computer to me. And then the difference that she had, she completely acted like she doesn't recognize her own voice as the computer when she was playing Luxana uh, and puts a little twang in her voice as Luxana and a little bit of yeah. alteration in her voice. So I thought that's something that's a credit to her skill. It's very professional. And anybody that doesn't know who does the voice of the computer, anybody that's just, you know, an average person watching this, they wouldn't say, hey, that's the same voice. You wouldn't, there's no connection there at all. We know that, uh, but we you can't tell from the performance because yeah, her Luoxana voice is higher. It it, it it dances around on those higher notes. Like, oh, I don't know, child, oh, child, you blah, 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 blah. You know, and she's kind of, it's whimsical. Mm -hmm. It's light. It's higher pitched. Um, you, like you said, it's got a twang. And then the the computer, it's low. It's matter of fact. And it's just, you know, almost like a, a slow staccato, like da 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 da, da kind of thing, you know. And it's just so you don't you don't even realize it's the same person. I, I can't imagine anybody that doesn't know it's her would ever have guessed it's the same person. So it's I agree, good talent, good talent. Um, also, a question that popped up to me, and I don't know what the science is on the transporter beam, but this is something that just the inner nerd in me kind of thinks about when I see stuff. And the thing that I thought about was when the at the end, when Luoxana's transporting and she does that good final, like, Jean-Luc, you know, again, about him having a nasty thought. But she's talking during the transporting. And uh, so she's she's kind of phasing out, but there's but she's still talking, and and it made me think, you know, question for Muhammad Noor, I guess. But um, is it possible to keep talking during a transport while you're in the process of actually beaming? Um, wouldn't you be in the process of separating those atoms or molecules at some point and? Would the sound still be able to, would you still be able to talk with not all your vocal cords still in place exactly because they're being beamed out? I, I just don't know. That is a very uh, interesting thought. I never considered that. I mean, my immediate thought is yes, because they can, it just seems like they would because otherwise they're like in suspended animation for a few seconds where they, they can't talk they can't see presumably they can't breathe they can't move you know but then at the same time imagining that if your molecules are being taken apart and put back together you wouldn't think you'd be able to talk or breathe or see or any of those things like you're that well, how could you how could you 
So yeah, I don't know. I never thought of that, but I think in the Star Trek universe, yes, you can still breathe and talk and do all those things. But thinking about it, it seems like you wouldn't be able to. It seems like well, this is no the first time way. I've seen it done, to my knowledge, mm -hmm. where somebody is mid beaming and still talking, and they actually mm -hmm. slowed that sequence down. So yeah. normally, when you're beaming out, they kind of go right into the dispersed matter, white kind of lines dissipated look really quickly but in this particular last beam out scene and in, in shot they actually beamed her out over a, 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 a longer period of time and showed that dismantling happening over a longer period of time long enough to get the line out about you know picard having nasty thoughts about her so i i thought that was a different thing that I hadn't seen before. I'm like, well, who have I seen before this mid sentence or actually complete a sentence as they're getting beamed out? I haven't mm -hmm. seen. It. Well, here's a question for you. Who gets the home run of the day? Home run of the day. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give it to the, um, the wardrobe guys and the and the makeup people for the antedians. Um, they're going to get it for me. I, uh, a, lo a lot of things left a lot more room for me to like, wanted to like this story a lot better. It just didn't come across. All the pieces were good. There were elements that I thought could have been used better, but weren't. Um, so the thing that I was impressed most about was the Antadian's costume and look. And so I guess the makeup and wardrobe department. Yeah, that's where I am as well. Um, definitely the makeup for me because it's a very different and new kind of alien. You could see where the eye holes were for the actors inside to see through. That's an old trick. You have like wrinkles in the front that people can just see through the slits. Um, so definitely the makeup department, um, and secondarily for Major Roddenberry for the reasons we just mentioned a few minutes ago, she's amazing. And everybody says she was an absolute wonderful human. Wish I would have met her. You have. Um, so yeah. she also gets the secondary one. <clears throat> Here are our friends that we want to give a special thanks to. And their names are Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman Tom, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin. Arukin. Uh, Whoa. Titus Mahler, Darlena Marie, Dr. Mohammed Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, the Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manisfee, Marsha Classic Schreier, Greg K. Wickstrom, and of course, Dr. Susan V. Gruner and Jason Oaken. Everybody, if you're watching this, make sure you go find us wherever you find your podcasts, your audio podcasts. And uh, you can find us under the seventh rule. All of our new Star Trek reviews are under the seventh rule and the number two. Please go check those out, subscribe, and uh, give us a five-star rating. We really appreciate it. Stick around. We've got the free-for-all up next. Here it comes on the seventh rule. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule with Sirach Lofton and our free-for-all family. Led by Melissa Longo. Hi there, folks. <laughs> We've also got Faith Howell, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Allison Leach Hyde. We have Jason Oaken, my live in Tokyo, Marsha Classic Schreier, Greg Kenzo, Carrie Schwent, the Matt Boardman, and the Dark Lord, Chris McGee. All right. Do we have any? Uh, oh, so sorry. Jake Sisko guesses the IMDb score. Whoa. Uh, Is it higher or lower than Carol Stryken's height? He's seven feet tall. Uh, 
seven. Yeah, oh. way lower, way lower. <laughs> um, <laughs> closer to uh, how tall is Will Wheaton in this episode? Uh, too I tall. No, I was yeah, too tall for even this episode. Too I would tall say Jones. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm going to be nice and give it a five. Boy, that is very nice, Roth. Does anybody else have any guesses that doesn't already know? (laughs) 6.8. What? (laughs) 5.75? Can I go (laughs) decimal? No, I literally literally didn't hear you. That's why I said, watch off. Oh, yeah. No, 6.8. I'm going to go off of, this is not my score, but this is what I'm guessing other people are feeling about this episode. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, right. The, the score right. is probably, yeah. Uh, yes. I, mean, I, yeah. I, I see sort of the public score as being maybe, you know, five and a half-ish. I wouldn't go that high personally. All right. Sue's pissed. You're going to get it now, Jason. <laughs> it is on IMDb, a 6.1. These people have no sense of humor. Right. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Agreed, Sue. Agreed. Uh, did anybody catch the non-appearance mention of the day? Um, is it Jordy? Doesn't he count? Because she went like this, and she didn't mention his name, but she mentioned him with his visor. Visor. But then it didn't end up being him, right? Because that was kind of like. I assumed the next scene we're going to see Jordy. Yeah, that's why it's a non-appearance mention. But I mean, but I mean, are we sure that she was referencing Jordy? Because she, I I thought she was referencing Jordy, but then they went to Riker. Uh, Yeah, but uh, he's the only one that has the. Yeah. Thingy. It was wearing sunglasses. (laughs) There's actually a scene in the script for that. It was there was actually that scene. It was was there, and they cut it out. Yep. I mean, the Got non-appearance it. mention is Roxana's husband. But, right. Uh, are all human men. <laughs> all human men. <laughs> all human men. <laughs> that means Ryan and Sarah. And <laughs> yeah, so Jordy, Loxana's husband, whose name I don't remember, but he does appear in a later episode. Awesome. Um, I thought I heard myself. Ryan. <laughs> yeah, she, they said, what'll it be, Madeline? She said, Ryan Ginger. Uh, for, a oh, second, yeah. <laughs> for a second, I'd like, but no. Not bad. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Melissa Longo, can you please get us off on the right track? Get us yeah. Off. And it's so, <laughs> I think this episode had some fun moments. Um, uh for instance, I really like the scene in Picard's ready room between Picard, Riker, and Troy, and they're talking about <laughs> the Betazoid phase. <laughs> and, and Riker's reactions in that scene were just priceless. <laughs> I don't know. He stole that scene for me. Um, and especially the way he looked at Troy when she was talking about and more. And he's like, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> and then she said, I didn't want to frighten you. <laughs> but he has a way of looking at her um, like he doesn't look at the other women that he has been with um there there is a something a little bit different in the way that he looks at her compared to everyone else and i like that um i find mr home thoroughly amusing <laughs> he's quite the lush <laughs> <Yes. laughs> and he, he's funny um wharf's line <laughs> when he's talking about the antedians um what a handsome race <laughs> that was funny Great. too um and then um when the antedians were eating after they first woke up i said ew because it was so <laughs> disgusting <laughs> gross um and then i'll finish up with by saying that the sele- the scene between pulaski and troy bothered me quite a bit (laughs) and I will tell you why 
uh, during Things Left Unsaid, along with my other nitpicks. What a tease. Excellent tease. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Melissa Longo. Faith Howell hanging out on the bridge of the Enterprise D. What did you think of this episode? I will just go ahead and jump in. I love this episode. Anything with Luoxana Troy in it, it, I'm sold. I love her to pieces, Um, maybe partially because she is the queen of Trek, but um, she's just so joyful and fun to watch. And I I think if she was a real person, I would love to just be in her presence. Um, And also her dresses are just... Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. Um... I was kind of struck um, that I remember viscerally these fish people from watching as a child, but I had no memory of, other than Luoxana being there, anything else that happened in the episode. And I wonder if it's just, as a child, it just went right over my head. Probably I had no idea what was going on, what they were talking about. And so it got deleted from the memory banks. But um, so it was almost like watching a whole new episode in that respect. So it's really entertaining. And um, I love how she plays off of Picard. And I, I, I can't wait to see the group's responses as that develops. But um, yeah, I'll just leave it with, I, I absolutely love her. <laughs> You're not alone. Um... My is live in Tokyo. What did you think of this episode? Well, let me put it this way. I thought I'd do a little riff on our fearless leader, doing what I call the Ryan rap. As you, when when you start out some of these episodes, we'll go with Captain Picard welcomes the Antideans to blank stairs. Wesley is not a fan of sashimi. Worf is not enamored of their resting bitch face, but of the handsomeness of their resting fish face. Loxana stops (laughs) back. Loxana stops by for a Jaeger visit. Jaeger means hunter. Uh, Picard's dress uniform reveals more than his ankles. Ambassador Choi's fondness for the reveal clearly rankles. A dinner invitation for one. Loxana takes the term "tis the season" to an entirely new level. Mister Hom chimes right. Mister Hom ch- chimes right in in gratitude for the meal. And Data unknowingly, wait, Data unknowingly bores with excessive Data, and Picard is grateful. Uh, in conference with Riker and Deanna, Picard mistakenly, perhaps appropriately so for this episode, refers to her as the goddess of the hunt by calling her Diana. And Riker grins at the thought of multiples of four or more. The mm-hmm. Chancellor has a scar. Loaxana likes her fish with sauce. And Mick is carrying a bomb. Deanna sees Riker as her imzadi. Loaxana simply sees him as a hot body. Back to you, Ryan. That is a great background, too, by the way. I missed that before. You've got Fleetwood Mac, but you got a fish head on Mick Fleetwood. Very good. Did you add that yourself? I did. Magic. <laughs> Looks great. Yeah, that's an A+. Plus. Good stuff. Uh, Jason M. Oaken is here, everybody, and thank goodness for that. What did you think of this episode that you loved very much? Well, Ryan, I have one word for it. Filler. And sometimes it's a, sometimes filler episodes can be good when there are too many of them, and the way they're done uh, can, can can certainly give you a different kind of an impression. You you can say the trials and tribulations is a filler, but what a filler! Mm-hmm. It's fun, it's exciting. Uh, again, uh, there are even in episodes that are not particularly great. There's you know there's scenes, there are moments, and there are some here for sure. Maybe for you know for five jokes that fall flat, one is funny. Uh, and I'm having a hard time figuring out what is this episode about? It doesn't seem to be about anything other than certainly giving Majel uh, her showcase. And it's wonderful to watch her. But the question is, is again, is it really a good Star Trek episode? It, is it fun to watch? To some degree, yes, it is. But overall, I think, you know, as a Star Trek episode, it, it leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, there were th- There are quite a few things I can say, and I'll save them for later, but I think if uh, the episode was preserved more in the way it was originally intended, it may have been better. Uh, some of what was cut may have made it a little bit more, at least, meaningful. Although it, it would still have been, for the most part, a filler. And there, there are too many of those in the second season. And we're, we're, we will conclude probably with the ultimate filler uh, for the second season. But overall, it's... Uh, 
I don't want to say it's a 42, 43 minutes, I will never get back. But a lot of it kind of feels like that. I think it's more than that because you've watched it more than once, man. I'm sorry to say, <laughs> it's like 200 <laughs> minutes. It will never get hey, Jason, back. also, I got to stick up for Ryan. Uh, he has way more than one out of five <laughs> flat jokes. <laughs> oh, thank oh, you're you. Doing about the episode. That there is a friend, everybody. <laughs> That's a friend. I second that too. <laughs> <laughs> Motion All is right. carried. <laughs> Allison Leach Hyde, please save us, and by us, I mean me. <laughs> it's bring on the bad jokes. I love bad jokes. They make me happy. Same. Same. Yes. Same. I concur. <laughs> uh, more emotions are packed. Wholeheartedly. <laughs> so I do enjoy this episode. I have always enjoyed this episode. I love Troy in her mom episodes because she does not hide the fact from everyone that her mother is a lot. And especially for her, the line of, Please, mother, do not do this to me on the bridge in front of the entire crew. Like, uh, uh-uh, mom, no. <laughs> I'm like, go you. Putting up your boundaries, letting everyone know your boundaries. Like, mom, my mom is too much. You all know. So, and she, you know, Waxana loves Deanna. And so she she takes it on the chin, like, I still love you and I'm gonna be me. And they both annoy each other to no end and appreciate each other to no end and i i love their relationship and it's always fun to watch so i always enjoy them and you know yay we got o'brien like right in the beginning so happy to see him happy to see robert o'reilly in his first star trek appearance so that's exciting he was scarface Thank you, Memory Alpha, for telling me. <laughs> Otherwise, I probably <laughs> would have missed it because I'm used to, you know, all the makeup. Yeah. But, you know. So, you know, there's a bunch of t- t- fun little lines. But I love the ending with how, uh, again, this is for O'Brien, is the Antedians are just full of high explosives. And he takes it like, no, nah, I'm not scared. This is cool. No, no facial expression change of, you know, I was just about to teleport people with a lot of explosives on them. Like it could have gone wrong. No, it's all cool. This is fine. So those are the type of things I like to catch. So I enjoy the episode. I watch it all the time. It's fun. (laughs) Yeah. Great stuff. Well, Brian really should check for explosives when he's beaming people into important dignitary conferences. Maybe that should be a thing. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, your thoughts on this episode and the outfits? Well, they get an A. And I could nitpick this to death, but instead I'm going to give it a 10. Because I love Majel Barrett. I love anything she does in Star Trek. She can get away with it. For sheer entertainment value, this episode is awesome. I already I wrote that I love her clothes. You believe that she's a little wacky. She's a little eccentric. She, again, she plays it so well. But what I really liked about this the most is that they show that older women can be sexually in their prime. And back then, that was not a thing. I mean, when I grew up, I was told that when I go through menopause, you know, things are going to change in my life. And all I can say is that Loxana Troy is absolutely right in her phase, whatever you want to call it. And I'm so glad that they brought that up in this episode. I loved it. And uh, yeah, I have some nitpicks, but for the most part, A plus. Fun. It was fun. A plus review to you, Dr. Susan V. Gruner. Uh, We've got the Matt Boardman here, everybody. What's up, the Matt? What do you think of this episode? Well, this episode, I watch it and I think, (laughs) Waxana, she's got a fever. And the only prescription (laughs) is more Picard Bell. (laughs) I, (laughs) sorry, that sounded more like Data as the the comedian. I should have finished that off with Badum Doom. You mean Carlos? Um, yeah, fever. <laughs> <laughs> um, this episode is fun. 
uh there's just a lot about it that that is uh silly and and wacky and and i think star trek needs that i mean we don't get that now because we have such short star trek seasons and so re-watching this helps me to appreciate these types of episodes that that maybe don't really do much in terms of you know an overall story but they're just they're an opportunity for the the cast and the crew to hopefully have a little bit of fun um i every time i see majel as waxana i always kind of like i have this thought like is is that just majel or did did majel later on in life eventually become waxana because I remember in 2008, I went to STLV and Rod and Trevor were <laughs> Trevor Roth were up on stage and they're they're talking about Roddenberry.com. And I, I think they were getting ready to launch the store that they used to have on there. And like Majel joins them on stage and she was every bit Waxana to Rod. Like, I mean, it was it was hilarious because he would start talking about something. She, she would go, but. But but Rod, I I why would you do that? I I don't understand. And, and like Rod, for his part, was trying like he was trying to be like patient with her. But you could also see those undertones of like he was a little annoyed that she's like questioning everything. You know, it was like that little kid that's like, ah, mom, come on, come on. But it was very very Luxana. And so I always appreciate her appearances as as Luxana because she she brings fun to it and uh, and a, and a levity that that we don't always get in some of these, especially these early uh, next gen episodes. And then the one last thing that I, I noticed this time around was, you know, we get call Meany, and for some reason, I don't know if it was the camera angle or what, but it was like, I was looking at it and I was like, man, he looks so young in this episode. And I mean, we've seen him before, but I was like, wow, hello, baby face. Bob O'Reilly looks super young too. For that two seconds that, he mm -hmm. comes out from under his hat. Mm -hmm. uh, good stuff there, the Matt Boardman. Thanks very much. Carrie Schwent, a.k.a. Crafty Bear, your thoughts? I love this episode. Waxana Wax completes my my trio of favorite characters with, with Q, and, Q and Wesley. I love how over the top she is. Her fashion is always on always on point and i honestly think and i as i'm taking my notes for this i finally decided i'm positive that she knows picard doesn't like her but she says what she does to him just for the pleasure of watching him squirm he will never convince me otherwise because there's no way he really he really does so she says that just to watch him squirm and i think it's hysterical every single time she does it and I decided the the song for the song for this episode is we got Daryl Hall and John Oates in their Dixon Hill attire behind me, thanks to a fun little AI generator I found. Is Man Eater? <laughs> taking notes for the song. That's I heard that song in my head as I was taking notes over the last couple of days for the for this episode. And so, of course, since I did did them, I had to throw Mick Fleetwood in in there in his D Dixon Hill attire. Dixon Hill attire too, because yeah, I'm not a hugest fan of of Fleetwood Mac. Eric likes them a lot, a lot more personally. Stevie Nicks's voice kind of drives me up a tree, but that's just me. And one th to get circle back to the back to the episode. Sorry about that. W something I noticed near the end of the episode, and it's another sort of blink and you miss it. But when Deanna and Waxana are walking out of the the turbo lift. She st um she stumbled. Deanna stumbles a little bit because she was trying not to step on all the material of mom's dress. I don't know how she didn't manage to just completely fall over, but she did a fairly gr fairly graceful graceful stumble. I absolutely recognized Robert Robert O'Reilly. Those eyes are unmistakable, so I wore my Ferengi eyes in 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 honor of him. And I had recognized him out of makeup before with an episode of dr quinn medicine woman that he that he was in and he's in that episode a lot more than the tiny tiny little scene he's in in this one but yeah rec recognize him immediately he is just adorable and i actually got to talk to him on our first cruise he loved making that dr dr quinn episode 
I don't think anybody had ever mentioned that to him before. Uh, yep, 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 yep. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, to... Oh, Picard is an evil genius. Call, calling Data down to to, to tell, some, tell some stories to kind of keep Waxana at bay. He's absolutely an evil, evil genius. And before I get to my, my, my limerick, I, there is one thing that also amused the heck out of me. Waxana talking to the computer, looking for Riker. She was literally talking to herself. And it makes me laugh every time. <laughs> Just a little bit every time I every time I watch this episode, but I will I will finish with this 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 week's limerick and it's Waxana based obviously. Searching for a mate is no easy thing. Do I want one that reads or one that sings? How about a new race, a nice change of pace? Because I'm looking for more than just a fling. Now her and Worf would have made it would have been intriguing and it looked like he was considering it for a hot second before she's like, nah, I'm used to, I'm used to human guys. Never mind. Those two would have been it would have been interesting, but Don't she was stop. not for Worf. Don't yeah, stop. I saw that's I a Hollywood Mac reference, that. by the way. Sorry. Yeah, Wesley. Wesley's like, "What was that all about?" And and Warp is about to explain it. And he's like, "No, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. what this is about." <laughs> all right, great stuff. Thanks very much, Carrie. Although we're all looking at you funny for not liking Fleetwood Mac. It's a little rough. Mm-hmm. Um, I like Fleetwood Mac. It's just Stevie Nicks's voice. I don't like. That's. Uh, that's- mm-hmm. Kind of a lot. Uh, <laughs> <It's so hard. laughs> okay. Uh, Greg Kenzo is here. What's up, Greg? What do you think of this episode? Hey, what's up? Uh, let me see. I don't think it's among TNG's best, but there were a lot of things I loved about it. Dixon Hill, one of my favorite things from TNG. I don't know if a lot of people like that holodeck in particular, but I think it's great. There's some charm about that period. The lighting clothes, the perpetual smog. But I might just love a noir look. That might just be it. Um, Loxana used to annoy me. Sorry to say, Sue, and everybody else that loves her. She She's grown on me, though. Like, definitely. over. The, and I think it was just the disruptive kind of element, like, coming into, like, all these the Star Trek people that are on the Enterprise, they're all kind of proper and have their own place, and they're all kind of in line. You know, it's they're an exploring academy, I guess, but it's very military like. You know, so I think it was that disruptive element that got me a little annoyed, but she grew on me and I grew to love her. And yeah, she's great. To comment on what Matt said earlier about Rod talking about Loxon being just like Majel. He actually said that recently on a different podcast, the Show Pod Show. He was on there, and he talked about how Majel is pretty much Loxana, and he gave a good story about her going to like an all man's night at some yacht club, and just you know, women weren't allowed, but she would go in there and she like, you know, would smoke cigars with them, tell dirty jokes with them. This is this is from his own mouth rod's own mouth so yeah she kind of did that in this episode she came in to the ship you know and i think that's funny that the captain and Riker and all these all these people that are usually in control when they're going up against insurmountable odds you know when they see waxana and her energy they kind of back away and it's funny because that's what kind of scares them and not all these other dangerous situations. Other than that, the philosophy of this episode, I, I kind of like to focus on philosophy. I think it represents diversity and the, the peculiar, peculiarities of culture. 
Loxana, the fish dudes, the card and the hollow novels, hollow novels. Data has a great comment in the beginning that sums up the Antedian fish creature story. He says, judging a being by its appearance is the last major human prejudice. But I think it's a commentary by the writers on why most of the aliens we see on Trek are humanoid aliens. They're all like bi bipeds. Yeah. And what I learned from the episode, I'm going to try to try this new thing because I thought it was a great, well, not a great episode, middling episode, filler episode. But this one, what it said to me was everything has some, something to offer. You know, this is something I try to remind myself of because I'm guilty of not kind of seeing people as one dimensional, you know, if they're, and that's how our society kind of places us, especially in the U.S., like your job will define you, you know, even though people are much more than what that. And yeah, I, I say this because Waxana, although she kind of disrupts everything over the storyline, she casually saves the day at the end, like nonchalantly and just like, okay, I'll take off. She saved the conference. They don't really address it, but I think that's the beauty of it. It's, it's a funny episode. First time I saw it, it was funny. Okay. Yeah. That's a good one. We definitely had some laughs. Uh, great stuff. Thanks very much, Greg Kenzo. Marsha Classic Schreier is here. Hello, Classic. Your thoughts? Hello. Um, well, I think everybody's pretty much said everything that I have in my notes, um, except for what I consider the worst line uh of the episode the hallway scene with troy and uh pulaski and when an animal is at its best when being hunted or hunting i uh, i almost lost it there but then counter that with warp's line which was my favorite what a handsome race i mean that's just brilliant um i think everybody in this group knows how i feel about season two so I tried when I rewatched it yesterday, I tried to approach it as a comedy, which whenever you have Loxana Troy, except with an exception of a couple episodes later on in future seasons, um, it basically is a comedy. So um, I really liked her, her, her overacting, her over the top delivery of every line and, and um it made me enjoy the episode a lot more um, and her saving the day. One thing that I didn't remember uh, was the, the naming of the phase. And I'm wondering if we ever see it or hear about it again. Um, I don't want to give away any spoilers to anybody, but I'm trying to remember Deanna in Picard episodes, and I don't think there's any mention of anything like that. Maybe because she's only half um, Betazoid, she doesn't have to suffer through it. Um, what else? Um, I like the bartender. I don't remember the name of the actor who played the bartender, but he was he was really good, and he and his scenes with with Troy were were pretty funny. That's it. Excellent. Everything else was already said. <laughs> Great stuff. Thanks very much, Marsha. Uh, we've got the Dark Lord, Chris McGee, here to darken our spirits with knowledge. What did you think of this episode? Well, it's one thing about going last. It's always hard to think of something that hasn't already been said. I agree with uh, Allison, Ryan, and Carrie that... I mean, this was the first time I even noticed that Robert O'Reilly was in the episode. I had never noticed that before. And as Carrie mentioned, it's always lovely seeing Major Roddenberry talk to Major Roddenberry <laughs> as Mrs. Troy talking to the computers. Um, it, it's 
common knowledge by now, of course, everyone knows that Mick Fleetwood played uh, the Antedian in the episode. And uh, I'm sure he probably didn't enjoy the makeup process either uh, when going through that. Um, am I the only one who, upon seeing the Antedian's, I guess, clothes, was reminded immediately of Daniel's shower Halloween costume in the Karate Kid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously the color is different, yeah. but I mean, it's, it just has the same kind of shape to it. Um, this, of course, is our second visit to the world of Dixon Hill after the big goodbye. And so that was kind of, kind of interesting. And I'm sure it was not by accident that the song they chose to play on the radio in his office was Let's Get Away From It All. Um, so all in all, it was a fun episode. Yeah, there's there's no, you know, stakes. There's no crisis unless you count the Deus Ex Loxana at the end. Um, <laughs> and as for my memorable quote, of course, everyone's already picked my first choice. What a handsome race. So I'll go with my second one, a counterpoint to that, which is still so they look better in sauce. <laughs> oh, yeah. Loxana Troy's line. That's a good one. All right. Thanks very much, Mr. McGee. Uh, Jake's final take. Sirach, any uh, final thoughts on this episode? Um, yeah, you know what? I was going to say that one major was um, just a, a remarkable and pleasure to be around. She's just such a, a lovely person. And so you you find yourself always rooting for her and cheering for her. and. Uh, she comes from a good place when she comes with her energy. So even when she's playing Watson, I feel like it's from a good place, even though she's slightly manipulative and <laughs> calculative. But still, she ultimately means well uh, at the end of the day. So much like Majel, um, who's just such a bright you know, person to be around, who has this glow about her. And... Um, I was thinking about watching uh, sports, specifically when I watch basketball, and there's moments when a player takes over the game. And that's when they really dominate the style of the game, the pace of the game. It's clearly they're setting the tone. And what Majel has an ability to do is when she comes, she sets the tone. It's, it's really kind of a, a big presence. In, in her personality, but she just doesn't like fly under the radar. She dominates. You know she's there. She's just, her presence is very big. Um, so I think that's his credit to just, you know, her not being afraid to take that challenge and, and shine in those moments. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting is that she's the boss's wife, I guess you could say, right? And and they always have these stories where they're trying to kind of, you know, hook her up with somebody, right? And I thought how much, you know, how difficult it is as an actor trying to work with that if because there's only so much chemistry you could possibly show knowing that it's the boss's wife. So I always wondered about how they felt working with scenes with her um if there was any of that element of like i don't want to you know um uh, cross any lines or or go too far appear to go too far so i wondered if that was part of it but certainly she dominates in her performance and i think that every time i've seen her whether i like the episode or not you know much has to do with this script she's just going with what the script says but um, her personality is dominant and you never forget episodes like her presence on an episode. You never say, oh, I wonder if she was in there. No, you know she's in the episode when she's in the episode. So that's a credit to her, um, her greatness, her personality, her being able to shine uh, both on screen and off screen, which I've seen her do in just personal interactions. She's just that amazing and such a focal point of your energy when she's in your own country. so that's it yeah i know we all wish we could have met her I, I definitely do we missed out on a great 
Uh, that's about it for us, everybody. Hey, if you want homework for next week, this will be fun. You know how Star Trek always says it's some kind of or some sort of, they always say some kind of anomaly or some sort of anomaly. They love those lines. And sometimes there's like super cuts you can find that have like every time they've ever said some kind of or some sort of. Uh, maybe next week we see if we find one in an episode. Because that'll be a fun thing. You look for non-appearance mentions. You look for a some kind of or some sort of. Melissa's like, that sounds fun, but weird and dumb. She's right. No, no, it sounds fun. And I'm up for the challenge. I was thinking, ooh, scavenger hunt. Yeah, that's, Jason's going to cheat. He's going to look at the script. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's it for us, everybody. Thank you to Melissa, Faith, my Jason, Allison, Sue, Matt, Carrie, Greg, Marsha, Chris, for myself, Melissa, Sirach, and Mr. Aaron Eisenberg. Thank you all very much for joining us. We'll see you next time. And until then, always remember the seventh rule.